channel open. Welcome back to Weekly Trek, a proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions Podcast Network. I am your host, Alex Perry. What's today's date? The date. Today's show was recorded on July 16th, 2020, and is current through Star Trek Picard Season 1, so beware of spoilers. All right, let's get into the show. Good day, Voyager, and welcome to A Briefing with Neelix. It's a catchy title, isn't it? Weekly Trek is a 30-minute news show covering the biggest stories from the Star Trek franchise. We are in a new golden age of Star Trek. There are six television shows in production, possibly more on the way, and enough merchandise to fill the Bajoran wormhole. So stick with me, and I'll help you sort the real facts from a lot of the Dominion propaganda that you'll find online. But I can't do this alone, and my guest this week is returning guest, Ron Robel. Ron, welcome back to Weekly Trek. Thank you, Alex. Very excited to be here. All right, Ron, well, you know the drill. I want to know something that's got you feeling good about Star Trek at the moment. What's got you moving at War 10? Well, so I think this is my third appearance on the show now, and every time I think I've had the same thing that I'm so excited about, and that's just the state of Star Trek. But right now, it was an epiphany I had the other day. I'm always going back and forth. Who's my favorite Star Trek captain? You know what? I, I can say it's Captain Pike now. <laughs> you can. I never considered him a real captain because he wasn't one of the stars of the show and having strange new worlds come on. I'm so excited about this show. Yeah, I want to hear more about when they're going to start filming. I mean, obviously, you know, totally understandable why we don't have much information about that because of coronavirus and everything going on. But I am chomping at the bit for them to get on with the show. Absolutely. I've got the um, Eagle Moss, the version of the Enterprise from Discovery. And it's such a beautiful ship. Everything about this show is going to be so aesthetic pleasing. I can't wait to see it. Yeah, the, the updated Enterprise design. I mean, for as much as, as anybody might, you know, have mixed feelings about them doing sort of visual updates, I mean, set that aside, it is just a, an absolutely gorgeous design for a starship. Absolutely. You know, I grew up with Next Generation, and I've always been a fan of that generation of Star Trek, the next generation, if you will. And the problem I had with the original series was it, it seemed so old. And they've done such a great job of taking that 1960s aesthetic and merging it with modern day, I'm just, it's going to be a lot of fun. It is going to be a huge amount of fun. Well, the thing I'm feeling good about Star Trek this week is the latest novel release. That is Die Standing, the new Star Trek Discovery novel by John Jackson Miller. And this book focuses on the Mirror Empress Giorgio. So by the time this episode comes out, I think my review will have been posted up at trekcore.com. So if you're interested in more thoughts about this book, you can get them there. But this is a fun one. We're now seven for seven in good Star Trek Discovery novels that are worth your time. And this one is no exception. It is a pretty fun book. Like the rest of the Discovery novels, it's sort of designed to help fill in a gap around the show. In this case, it's what happens to Giorgio between the season one finale of Star Trek Discovery and when she appears again in season two in the third episode. Sort of how does she go from where we left off to her being a Section 31 agent. And it's a very fun story. It has some fun characters. And if you are a fan of Michelle Yao's portrayal of the Mirror Emperor Giorgio, you'll get a real kick out of this one. If you are not so much of a fan of the character, I think this one's probably not going to change your mind about it. But even if you are conflicted about the character because she's a genocidal mani- maniac <laughs> that the writers of the show are trying to do a really, you know, a rehabilitation job on, if you you find Michelle Yao's portrayal to be delicious fun in any way, shape, or form, this will be the book for you. So I had a good time reading this one, and, and it's my pick this week. I love it. I, I read the, I didn't read, I listened to the audio versions of the first four of the Discovery books, and they've all been so fantastic. This one's definitely going to be on the list. And as far as her being a genocidal maniac, she's a genocidal maniac that we all want to love because we love Captain Georgiou so much. Right. Yes, yes. And the book sort of plays with that too. And there's also, and you know, it's always nice to get some prime Georgiou and there is some prime Giorgio in this book as well. That is great. All right. Well, with that, let's turn to the week's top stories. There's a war going on. And I'm a reporter. Captain's Log. Stardate 57436.2. First contact is a delicate, high-stakes operation of diplomacy. One must be ready for anything... <gasps> Captain's log? <laughs> We're all supposed to keep logs. Okay, let me listen to it. No, go away. Leave me alone. <laughs> I can't believe you're no, wasting no. your shore leave on this. Whoa. This is the greatest ship I've ever seen. Hey, 
you! Green girl! Hold this! Don't pass out! Oh. Sorry, sorry. I'm good at exploring strange new worlds and solving space mysteries. Let's see what I gotta sign. Holodeck waste removal. That's Klingon prison stuff. Oh. 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 Ensign, do you see a captain's chair in your future? I hope so, ma'am. Hey, if I part my hair like this, do I look more promotable or less? The Cerritos might be falling apart, but that's our job to keep it together. Ensign, you are a natural-born warrior. Okie dokie. And we're here? No, we're actually way down here. Keep it moving, Lower Decks. Next! My senior staff are always up for a challenge. Nothing like a cold beer after a smooth second contact. Now that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah! It is better down here where the real action is. We're gonna surf side by side. An elite team. We're not really elite. We're more like the cool, scrappy underdogs. We are so getting fired for this. Attention all decks. Lives are at stake. But our crew is ready and focused. Ooh, this is the new shuttle with the blast shield. It's a blast Stop shield, it. nope. it's a blast it shield. Works. And it, it comes works. down okay. and it goes up. Blast it. shield! It. We live on a spaceship. Oh. Nobody is dying from a spear wound. Ah. Hang in there, you got this. Oh. Oh. Space, the funnest frontier? Long range sensors have located a very sexy. <gasps> No, definitely no, no, no to this, and also that. Oh, you almost phasered me. Calm down. It's set to uh, it was it was set to stun. Yes, that's right. As we speculated ahead of next week's San Diego Comic Con at home, CBS have released the first trailer for Star Trek Lower Decks, which you just heard. Thanks to some intrepid fans who snooped out a private YouTube link for the Canadian distributor CTV last Sunday, the trailer was released before its planned distribution as a bootleg version had started to light up the internet. And as you can hear, it is great fun. Fun, funny, and filled with so many references and visual gags to the Berman era of Star Trek. Obviously, this is an audio medium, so having just heard the audio from the trailer, you didn't get to see many of these sight gags, but a couple of things I noticed in the Master Systems display for the USS Cerritos. There were Argo buggies from Star Trek Nemesis. The dress uniforms for the Starfleet uniforms of this era look a lot like the Next Generation versions. There was a Napian crew member, remember the Next Generation episode, Eye of the Beholder. And there's also a really quick shot of Ensign Tendi wearing a stealth suit that looks just like the suits that Worf, Picard, and Crusher wore in Chain of Command. I am really excited about this show. I think it looks zippy. It is funny. I mean, that's a funny trailer, I think. And and it is obvious from just the two-minute trailer how much the writers and the animators and the actors love and care about Star Trek. I mean, there are just so many little details sort of socked away. And it is so, despite being animation, it looks so true and authentic to that Berman era, next generation era of Star Trek that I think it's going to be really, really delightful. Ron, what did you think? I agree with you 100%. I'm first so excited that it's going to debut when STLV was supposed to be in August. <laughs> so as we're all mourning our time hops in this day in history and seeing pictures of those past trips, we'll have something to get to late in that time. But the show looks so much fun. It really does. Being set in that Berman time, it you know, the corridors, everything about it is familiar. And I've seen a lot of hate for this show online, but I think when it airs, the fans are going to love it. I really do think it's going to have the Easter eggs and it's going to be a lot of fan service, but done in a way that it's, if it, we provide fan service in a serious show like Discovery, it sometimes doesn't hit right. Where if it comes in an animated series like this, I think it's just going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be a lot of, you know, sight gags and, you know, quick blink and you miss it type things. I mean, certainly yep. from the trailer, it looks like, you know, I, I keep coming back to this one word, energetic. It's going to be an energetic show. Absolutely. You know, the trailer's full of all these quick cuts and it's within those those little kind of you know moments that you get those little total throwaway visual references to things that don't matter at all to the story but are going to be really fun to sort of pick through and find and yeah i mean you know look star trek fans have a real issue with things that are new and different and lower decks is possibly the newest and most different thing that they've had to contend with right i mean we've had an animated show before but the original animated series is you know a, a very different beast from what Lower Decks is supposed to be, right? Lower Decks is a exactly. comedy. And it's 
presented as a comedy, but it's presented as a serious comedy. I mean, I think I get that sense from the trailer as well, right? There's a lot of funny here, but there's also funny in a way that is, that seems to me anyway, from a two minute trailer, totally authentic to Star Trek and to the franchise that we know and and love. And I think, you know, it's going to take people in the same way that it takes for every time there's a new show, it's going to take some people a while to get on board. And there are some people for whom they're never going to be on board. And there Mm -hmm. is, of course, a certain population of people out there who are determined to hate every new Star Trek product with every fiber of their being, even when that is totally divorced from the logic of the situation. And to those people, you know, we just set them aside. But I think for other fans who are maybe looking at this and thinking, you know, animation, I'm not really sure that's for me. Comedy, I'm not really sure that's for me. I have no doubt that the show is going to make a hard run at their love and affection over time. And I think ultimately, you know, a show like this, it's going to do a lot to open the franchise to new people. People. You know, right now, Discovery, Picard, fantastic shows, but they're not really bringing in that college age, you know, they're not bringing in new fans. And I think Lower Decks is going to be something that a lot of new people will be able to get into and look at that and say, well, wait a minute, what are all these other Star Treks that I've heard about? That is it exactly. I mean, we are closing in on 800 hours of this show, of this franchise as a whole. And we're talking about doing 10 episodes, 20 episodes over two seasons to do something a little different. Nobody has to watch it if they don't want to. I don't blame anybody who doesn't want to watch it if they don't want to, because you know, Star Trek, it doesn't have to be all things to all people, and not everything has to appeal to everybody. With that much show, it's okay that there are products that appeal to to some people more than they appeal to others, and then for there to be other products that appeal to those people that maybe don't appeal so much to the other groups. So like, there is lots of opportunity here for us to bring more people in and get a look at you know, this franchise and and any kind of way we can get more eyeballs on these shows and, and that encourages them to look at other shows, I think, you know, more power to us, right? Absolutely. And just side note, the Ceratos, I'm so not sure if I'm saying that right. It's a beautiful ship. I love the design of Starfleet ships. And this one is already at the top of my top. I'll give this to Trek ranks. It's in my top five already. (laughs) Yeah, this is a very cool ship. I really like the design. And it was when we saw it, when the premiere was announced, I guess it was two weeks ago now, you only saw it from the front on. And actually, once you get a full 360 view of it, it it looks really good with the nacelles and the the deflector that's sort of held between the nacelles, but set back from the saucer. I mean, and that's another thing too. We, Discovery and Picard are great ships. Shows, but one of the things that they have de-emphasized is what I will just call a spade a spade starship porn. And this trailer in two minutes has a ton of starship porn in it. And I'm totally on board for that. Absolutely. If our friends at Eagle Moss are listening, I want this ship. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they will provide. Do you have a particular character that you're most interested in at this point? I don't. I'm I'm just anxious for the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, it just it looks so much fun. Yeah, me too. I think the the trailer definitely seems to focus a little more on. I'll see if I can remember the names: Ensigns Mariner and Boimler. I guess that's Tawny Newson and Jack Quaid's character. The 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 two red shirted ensigns, and I I I like both of them already. I, I we don't get a lot of either Rutherford or Tendi in the trailer. And so there's less for me to go on, but I'm really liking the dynamics between these characters so far. And I think a lot of people like Ensign Tilly from Discovery because she's kind of more relatable. We can all as fans kind of see ourselves in her. And I think that's going to resonate a lot with the characters in this show. None of these people are at the top of their class. <laughs> you know, you right. can tell they're not the creme de la creme like we're used to seeing. So it's we're going to see a lot of ourselves in them. And we got uh, one line from a character who I think is going to end up being a fan favorite, Dr. Ta'ana the Cation chief medical officer of the ship and already seems to have worked her way into the hearts of many a fan. Love it. Can't wait. All right. Well, we will certainly uh, learn more about Lower Decks at San Diego Comic-Con at home next week. But I'll just say, if you haven't had the opportunity to check out this trailer, what the hell are you doing? Get yourself over to Star Trek.com or over to social media channels for Star Trek and give this one a watch. I think this one will be worth a lot of fans' times. Well, we will leave that there for now and move on to our next story, uh, which is a fun one if you don't like paying for Star Trek. 
So Pluto TV, the free ad-supported streaming service, which was purchased by Viacom last year in advance of the merger with CBS, is expanding to include Star Trek. So this is a free streaming service in... I think it's in the US. I, I actually don't know if it's if it's available in other countries, but certainly in the US. Pluto TV, you just Google it, you load it up, and you have access to, it's effectively like a bunch of different channels. And on these channels, they've got certain content playing. And there's now a Star Trek channel that is playing Star Trek The Next Generation. So, you know, in the same way that if you just turned on your TV and went over to BBC America, you'd probably get yourself halfway through an episode of Star Trek. On Pluto TV, you get yourself pretty much halfway through an episode of Star Trek. I loaded it up earlier, and the Arsenal of Freedom had just started playing, and it was like somewhere in the first act. It's ad-supported, that's why it's free, so you do get quite a lot of commercials. I mean, you get pretty much the same number of commercials as if you were watching it on regular television. A 42-minute episode lasts for an hour, so it's 42 minutes of episode and then 18 minutes of commercial. But if you're okay with the commercial and you either can't pay for one of the streaming services or for the Blu-rays and DVDs and you're looking for a low cost, indeed free fix for Star Trek, Pluto TV is probably the place for you to start. They only have Star Trek The Next Generation right now, but they have indicated plans to add more Star Trek series in the future. So I tweeted earlier this week that I had this wish for CBS to come up with a version of this where it was just playing all Star Trek episodes all the time and you could just load it up and click into the channel and then it would just be whatever is on. And people responded and were like, oh, you should check out this Pluto TV thing that just launched. And it's great. I would prefer a version with no ads, but if you could do the ad version, you know, then this is exactly that and exactly what you want. Ron, what do you think about this one? Well, for, I love Pluto TV. I cut the cord a long time ago because cable is just crazy expensive and Pluto gives you that feeling. So when you just want to sit down and flip through channels, it's great for that. And a Star Trek channel, there's nothing better that I can think of. I know when I'm working from home, and I work from home quite a bit now, I always have Star Trek on in the background. I might not even be watching it, but as the background noise, that is absolutely what I have on. So it's perfect for any Trekkie. Um, and then going back to trying to bring new fans in, you know, a, all of the new Trek is behind a paywall. I subscribe. I love it. But that's not bringing a lot of new folks in. So hopefully they can do that with this channel. I think it's going to be a good way to recruit more Trekkies. Yeah, CBS certainly seemed to kind of view the original series through Enterprise as being a mechanism to do that. I mean, they've licensed it to pretty much every streaming service that exists. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter which one you've got, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime. They've got all the Star Treks up to 2005 on there. And yeah, I mean, you know, take any and all opportunities to try and get more people through the door. And this is a great way of doing so. And, you know, provides fans who otherwise don't necessarily have the money to be able to afford a Amazon Prime or a CBS All Access or a Netflix subscription, the ability to get some Star Trek in their life as well. And that is no bad thing. And if you look at the money that they spent, I can't remember if it was Picard or Discovery that had the really big ad campaign behind it, um, where they were, and it may have been both, where they were doing small spots during the Super Bowl even. Um, being able to do something like that with the new shows and see it for free for the first time on Pluto TV, I think can bring a lot of people to the Pluto TV platform. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if half of the ads on the Star Trek channel are for CBS All Access. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's good. I, I, and again, because Viacom and CBS have merged now, it's these perfect kind of opportunities for crossover between the different sets of IP that the two have, where you've got the Pluto TV on the Viacom side and you've got the Star Trek on the CBS side. It makes sense to put them together. Absolutely. Well, we got news of some really great looking merchandise this week. Factory Entertainment, who to date have released a small line of barware and other Star Trek collectibles smashed onto the scene in a big way by releasing and then quickly selling out of a replica of the teacup used aboard the USS Enterprise A in the banquet scene from Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. So the more famous teacup from the movie is the one from the start of the movie on the Excelsior, where first shot of the movie after you see Praxis explode is Captain Sulu sipping from this teacup. But in the banquet scene later in the movie, where, you know, it's the Klingon and so the Starfleet officers in the conference room having dinner together, there are these teacups all over the table, and it's the same kind of teacup as the Excelsior teacup earlier. They're actually, they were, this factory entertainment version is a recreation of it, but they were off-the-shelf 
products from a company called Foutsgraf, which makes all kinds of China teacups and dinner sets and tea sets and stuff. And basically the production bought a whole bunch of them and then put stickers on them for the Excelsior and for the Enterprise A. Actually, once upon a time, I, I actually owned one of the originals from the movie. And Factory Entertainment have recreated it and they have issued it as a product to sell. The release, which was a San Diego Comic-Con at home virtual exclusive, was limited to 500 pieces and it sold out in less than a day. This was a really, really popular product and I think even more popular than Factory Entertainment were, were expecting. But wait, there's more. So this is not public as of the time of recording, but by the time this episode comes out, it will be public and it may even be sold out. So I apologize in advance if that's the case, but they are doing an Excelsior version of the teacup. It will be limited to just 250 pieces and is also expected to sell out really quickly. So if it's not gone by the time you hear this, make sure you get yourself over to Factory Entertainment to grab one. And I hope you have already done so if you wanted to. I mean, this is, for me, a really exciting release. It's a great product. The teacups look really good. It's the kind of thing that, you know, you could actually use at home as a teacup if you wanted to. It looks very close to the original version that was included on screen, both the Excelsior version and the Enterprise A version do. And quite an affordable piece. I mean, $30 for a cup and saucer is probably expensive if you're going out to get a teacup and saucer for your home. But as a Star Trek product, especially given the ultra high prices we've paid for some stuff lately, I'm thinking about, you know, the Roddenberry reproductions and things like that. $30 is actually pretty great, nice, affordable piece that lots of fans can buy and lots of fans did because those 500 Enterprise A teacups sold out in a hot second. So here's hoping the success of these two pieces spurs Factory into creating many more affordable affordable Star Trek products that fans want in the months and years ahead. And I will confess to having bought two Enterprise A cups. And when they go on sale at two o'clock tomorrow, I do plan to make sure I'm online to pick myself up a couple of the Excelsior versions as well. Ron, is this something that interested you? I'm interested in everything that is Star Trek. Unfortunately, I don't have space. <laughs> I saw this <laughs> ah, yeah, it was yeah. so beautiful. And I was even more excited. I love the Excelsior for some reason. Um, and hearing that that's the one, I just saw a Trek Corps tweet saying it's something was going to be available tomorrow. So uh, I wish I had space for it. I would be right on top of this, but they are beautiful. Um, and the Trek article, it shows a picture of the screen used one. They're identical. I mean, it really, it looks fantastic. Uh, and like you said, for $30, some of these these replicas are expensive. This is a great price point. Well, that is not all that's going on in the merchandise world at the moment. Fansets had an exciting announcement this week, which is the expansion of their full-size Star Trek badge collection. So as you may recall, and we covered it here on Weekly Trek about a month ago, Fansets released a full-sized version of the Starfleet Com badge from Star Trek Picard. And now we know what the next release is in their series of full-size Star Trek badges will be. So following the Picard com badge that was released last month and sold out in record time, there will be a Discovery Delta badge. So the main badge from Discovery, she looks very similar to the QMX version that was released a few years ago and is actually getting harder to find. So great to have a new source of the Discovery badge. That will then be followed by the Section 31 black badges. But... They're by no means limiting themselves to just new Star Trek shows. After that, they have planned a series of releases that will reach back into the history of the Star Trek franchise. And the next one up after the Section 31 Black Badge will be the com badge from the alternate future timeline seen in All Good Things, The Visitor, and Endgame. Fansets promises to there will be more releases in the future that will include the Voyager and Deep Space Nine com badges. Many of the designs are modeled off of screen used badges for reference, meaning they'll be high quality and accurate to what was seen on screen. And fansets have also promised to deliver, particularly for the Berman era badges, something that fans have long asked for, which is a matte finish to the badges instead of the shiny chrome style that QMX used for their TNG and Voyager com badges they released a few years ago. Uh, at this point, the badges are still pins because that's what Fansets has the license for. So no magnetic backs yet. Unfortunately, QMX still holds the license for the magnet pins. But as pins, these are really great pieces. And I think, you know, you probably expect that many fans would want to use them on all kinds of things, including on their costumes, because like, you know, the All Good Things com badge, for example, who's making a really high quality All Good Things com badge that's licensed at the moment? Absolutely no one. So it's great that Fansets is coming in and providing products to 
two Star Trek fans that they want, the Discovery Delta pin is available for sale right now on the Fansets website. It's on sale for $17.95. And I think the plan is for the additional badges to be released monthly. So Discovery this month, Section 31 next month, all good things the month after that. And then very excited to see what will come later. Ron, these are much smaller than teacups. Think you'll be adding any of the Fansets badges to your collection? Yes, I will place them right next to my QMX badges. You know, I have the Discovery Command 1 and the Section 31. And they're great. I don't like the magnets. I find that they fall off much easier than the, the good pen backings. Um, and these are beautiful. Trek Core has a picture of them with the Fansets one next to the QMX one. And the Fansets one, it has a better mat to it. QMX has been great. But I know my Section 31 has already scuffed a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Fansets, the quality is just definitely going to be there. Um, so I think with these, you have to get two. One for cosplay that can be possibly damaged. Um, and then one just to put on the shelf because these are beautiful. Yeah, and you know it's it's nice that these pins are available, and and the sky's the limit, really. I mean, if people buy them, you can see fan sets, you know, reaching right down the list to make all kinds of different badges that maybe have never been sold on the market before. Trek Core, when they were announcing it, you know, and they were running down the list of like fan sets that said they're going to do this one and this one and this one, then sort of asked the qu- a question at the end that was, what kind of badges would you like to see? And and there were a lot of fun ideas there, including things like the Bajoran Com badge. Well, there's not been a Bajoran Com badge since the late 90s where there was that one that stuck to a little voice console where when you pressed it, you know, it would it would speak lines from the show, you know, and that was that was twenty twenty five years ago at this point that that came out. So wouldn't it be great to have a Bajor in Combat? Wouldn't it be great to have the twenty ninth century Combat from Future's End and Relativity? You know, I think there's a lot of fun stuff that they could produce to add to this collection that's never been a licensed collectible before, and that could actually be you know really really fun. And they've done such a good job of just their pin line is so enormous as it is. You know, the concept of them coming. Out doing 50 different combat just isn't crazy because they've done it already with the ship's lines and with the character pins. Um, it's, it's exciting, for sure. All right. Well, we've talked about the facts, and now let's speculate on what's going to happen in the future of Star Trek. You make some very good points, Captain. But it's still all speculation and theory. So each week, I and my guest give you a wish or theory we're nurturing about Lower Decks, Picard, Discovery, Strange New Worlds, Merchandise, the future of the franchise, whatever we want. So Ron, let's hear your theory or wish for this week. So my theory for this week has to do with Lower Decks. I think we are going to see a lot of cameos. Like I think we're going to be shocked at the number of cameos. They might not be character specific. I think you mentioned last week talking about Robert Picardo possibly coming back to do the EMH. And that got me thinking, even so many of these performers have done voice acting for different characters that I could see them come in and lending their voices to something completely different. And it'll just be another piece that the fans can listen to and love. You know, you might have Marina Sirtis coming in. She might not be Counselor Troy, but she could be voicing something else. I think we're going to see a lot of those that haven't been announced. Yeah, I guess the question is in some ways to what extent will Lower Decks adopt some of the structures and mechanisms for comedy that other kind of big animated shows have used in the last few years. Like, you know, I'm thinking of something like Family Guy, right? I'm not saying that Lower Decks is going to be just like Family Guy, but but one of the things that that show is very famous for is quick asides and someone remembers something and they need a quick side scene where you sort of see that play out. And I think if they do stuff like that, that opens up a whole realm of possibilities of different characters who could appear, you know, just very quickly and you could get a high volume of characters through. And even the possibility of, like you said, doing flashbacks where it may even be the characters that we've seen before. Um, And I know I've personally, I've described this show to friends. I've used Family Guy as an example. I know it's by the folks who've done Rick and Morty, but it just seems like such a good mesh with with the family guy background as well are there any characters that you would be particularly interested in seeing quark i love my ferengi i want to see more ferengi in all the series right now (laughs) well he got himself a mention in star trek picard and lower decks is the perfect kind of place for some of these actors who really don't want to have to put the makeup back on but maybe would be interested in reprising the character in a voice role to play those characters again but without having to do six hours of makeup at the beginning and end of every day right so let's ask you if you could have any one character come back for a cameo in lower decks who would it be that is an excellent question 
I'd like a Q episode. I think Q would fit in very well with the Lower Decks aesthetic. You know, it's comedy and Q's a funny character. So uh, yeah, I think I would pick Q. I could totally see John Delance jumping on that too. <laughs> yeah, I could see a lot of them jumping on it. I mean, especially right now, right? Everybody's at home. All you need is a quiet room, you know, go into your closet, shut the door and a high quality microphone and a script and you can, you know, bang out a job in a couple of hours in a way that, you know, people are going to, really like and is going to get you an opportunity to, you know, return to the public eye, even if very briefly. Like, I, I think, you know, f- as far as like voice acting is concerned, it strikes me that there's probably not a lot of Star Trek actors who would turn down the opportunity to do that if offered. I can see why many of them, you know, being older and being done with the roles would not necessarily want to come back for live action. But, you know, for a voiceover job, it seems to, to me, it seems like it opens a much wider range of possibilities for the kind of folks we could see reappear. Well, and we've even seen it with Family Guy. I think they had, I think it was the whole cast of Next Generation that reprised their accurate who they were on the show. They weren't playing their characters, they were playing themselves. Well, we are now three weeks away from the premiere of Lower Decks. And my wish this week is a fairly simple one. I want to be delighted by it. And everything I've seen to date tells me that I think I will. It looks funny and vibrant and yes I'm going to use the word again energetic and it's the perfect kind of looking summer Star Trek to and Jen Tift has said this every time she's been on that nice kind of change of pace after the much more dramatic Discovery and Picard to get something lighter and more fun especially with everything going on. I want this show to be something that celebrates Star Trek and makes me celebrate being a Star Trek fan that you know, makes me laugh and makes me nostalgic for the shows that I really enjoyed and gives me more of that aesthetic and more of that kind of sort of late 90s star trickiness for want of a more elegant turn of phrase. I just really want to be delighted by the show. I am rooting for it so hard. When, when it was first announced, I remember thinking myself, Oh, I'm not sure this show's going to be for me. You know, I'm not sure I'm necessarily going to respond to animation. Not necessarily sure I'm in on the comedy idea. And, you know, over the last, I guess it's been a year and a half since the show was first announced. I've done a total 180 and I am 100% ready to like the show, to love this show. And so far, based on everything we've seen, which granted is not a lot, I am very, very hopeful, but I am wanting to be utterly delighted and satisfied by a new Star Trek production and Lower Decks is the next thing up. And so I am pinning many of my hopes there. I just, I want to really like it and to get to the end of every episode and feel fulfilled and like it was a fun experience. And everything I'm seeing so far is telling me that fingers crossed, I'm going to get what I want. I'm with you 100%. I, I was in the same boat too when they announced an animated series. Like, okay, this will be great. But seeing the trailer, I'm completely sold on this show. It's going to be so much fun. Do you have a theory or a wish for Discovery, Picard, or the future of the franchise that you'd like to share? Tweet them to me at Weekly Trek, and I might feature your theory in a future episode. Well, that's all the time we've got for this episode of Weekly Trek. Thank you so much to my guest, Ron Robel, for joining me today. Ron, how can people contact you if they want to continue the conversation? I've become much more active on Twitter. I am Trekker Ron at Twitter. And you are a great follow, so I highly recommend everybody do so. And you can find this show on Twitter at Weekly Trek and me at Alexander T. Perry. And if you enjoy the show, please consider leaving us a five-star review on your podcast player of choice. And please check out some of the other great shows on the Tricorder Transmissions. And if you like our shows, please Please also consider becoming a Patreon of Tricorder, which you can find at patreon.com slash the Tricorder Transmission. And lastly, if you're looking for Star Trek news on the internet, I hope you'll turn to trekcore.com. Well, thank you, Ron. Thank you to all of my listeners. And until next week, live long and prosper. Prosper.